Well, good morning. La Barritas, I would say, if I were in Lithuania right now. Uh, but unfortunately, Corona is still a, bit, a big threat, so uh, we're going to do this online. Um, I am hope you're safe and uh, maybe already vaccinated. I had my first vaccination on Friday, and boy, I love the weekend. I was really tired, but happy to be here with you. So my name is uh, Raudi, Raudi Rabau. I was born and raised in Gouda in the Netherlands, and I'm a freelance weapon app developer, but I'm also a senior engineer at the largest Dutch insurance company called National Nederlanden. And you can follow me on, or harass me or whatever on Twitter at uh, Raudi Rabau. And I love superhero movies, and one of those movies is uh, incorporated in this uh, presentation, so you'll notice that. So let's talk about PWAs. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of code in this talk and you don't need to write everything down at the end. The slides and the demo code uh, are available afterwards. Uh, just sit back and relax and uh, try to learn a thing or two. So PWAs, Progressive, progressive Web Apps. Um, this talk is about the fundamentals. So we start from the beginning. Uh, so we have a good understanding on how progressive progressive web apps works. I like to call it PWA uh, because that's easier to pronounce. PWAs are supposed to be reliable. They always load and will never show the dinosaur. I will show you in a bit. They are fast. They respond quickly to user interactions and they load fast also. And they should be engaging. They uh, feel like a native app on a device. Uh, maybe put it on the home screen, it's like quick, easy access. So people have uh, a more uh, need or a more uh, invitation to go to your app or website this way. Let's talk about uh, the list of key features of PWAs. They're linkable. Well, just, just web applications or websites. So you have a URL, so you can send a link to a friend of yours, you check this out. It's harder to do with an app, right? They are safe. They are supposed to run on the HTTPS only. And let's be frank, that's something you should do with any web application nowadays. They're discoverable through search engines, for instance. And that's really simple to explain because they're just websites. So you, the URLs can be indexed by search engines. They are responsive. They work on every screen resolution. Um, and that's a practice we've been doing quite a while now, right? So that's that's not really something new for you, probably. They feel like a native app. And especially the fast loading part and maybe the look and feel. You can still create a website um, that's fast loading and, and uh, make it a PWA. It doesn't really have to be an app. Keep that in mind. They're always up to date uh, because you're loading it from the web. You don't need to download an, uh, an update from the App Store. They're installable. As I mentioned, the home screen, you can put a, an icon on the home screen with a direct link to the application. And you can catch data. So you have all the data available locally for fast reference. And they are re-engageable. So as I mentioned, the home screen, it's it's there. People see it and it's like, oh yeah, let's let's check that out again. And you can also, for instance, use push notifications. Um, not everybody likes push notifications. Keep that in mind. Only use it when it's uh, really useful. For instance, if you run a weather website, you could send a push, a push notification about weather alerts, for instance, uh, but don't overdo it. And also they are connectivity independent. They can work offline if you do it right. Let's visit this website. You've probably seen it, you probably know it. Um, it's about that offline thing. If we go to the dev tools here and select offline and reload it, you can see, whoa, there's no internet. That's not nice. But we can play with the dinosaur. That's fun for a bit. But at one point, 
it's game over. This is not an experience you want to give to your users. One thing, progressive web apps love modern browsers. So if you're still running this thing and have to support it, I feel sorry for you, but never mind. PWA isn't a progressive enhancement. It's in the name already, progressive. That means that you can serve it to modern browsers without breaking the older ones. They just don't benefit from it. OK, let's look at some starter code that will be the base of our PWA. It's a pretty simple uh, web page. I just want to explain the basics and, and not make it all uh, too fluffy. So this is just an index file um, with an image and a title in the H1 uh, reference. I put in some CSS to make it look a little bit more pretty. And in the end, it looks like this. Nothing fancy, but it will serve its, its cause. Let's look at one of the things that make a PWA. And it's called a manifest file. What is a manifest file? A manifest file is just a simple JSON file. And it will inform the browser about your web application or a website. And it tells it how to behave when it's installed. And this is an example of how um, that manifest file could look. So you have a name, in this case, PWA Superheroes. That's the long name. And that's, that's used, for instance, for a splash screen. Uh, the short name is the name of your application that will be shown uh, underneath the icon uh, on the uh, on the home screen, for instance. You set the language, you set the start URL. In this case, I just want to start it from the root of the website. Uh, the scope, which pages are included. So I use a dot here and everything is included. Uh, you have the display, no, uh, display mode, so that's standalone, full screen, or browser. Um, I said it at standalone, make it like an app. The orientation, I set it specifically to portrait here. A background color that's used while loading the splash screen, a theme color uh, that will be used on the top bar in the task switcher, for instance. And you set the icons. And the icons is a set of icons that the browser will choose the best one from to use from, for the home screen, the splash screens and also the Apple icons. We'll get back to that. So what I do is in my uh, boilerplate HTML, I link to the manifest file, just like I would do to a style sheet. And let's see what happens if we go to the Chrome developer tools. But here you see some uh, information about your application, like the name, the short name, the start URL, and the colors. Uh, but you also see some warnings here, particular about that the manifest does not contain a suitable icon. That's true because we didn't define uh, those yet. So let's work on that. Um, you don't want to make all those icons yourself um, by hand because it's, it's a lot of work. So for this, we can use the PWA asset generator. Let's see how it works. I made a script to generate it. So I run M npm run generate, and it uses the SVG that I have to, in there. And it will create all those images for us. You have to little, be a little bit patient because it takes some time. And you see it's also generating all the Apple icons. They're starting to appear on the left-hand side as well. And that's it. And also, the manifest file and the indexed HTML are updated. So if you look at the manifest file, you see that there are two icons here now. And also, in the index file, I have all the Apple Touch icons as well. Well, for demo's sake, 
I'll, I'll leave those out of the HTML. Here you see again the, the manifest file with only two icons. So if we go back to the browser and we reload it, you see that the icons are now there and the warning has disappeared. And if we look at it, images are there. They have a white background. So let me switch to a, a darker theme in uh, the Chrome DevTools. And you can see they still have their white background. They are not transparent. OK, that was part one, the manifest file. Um, I told you you could add a link to your uh, home screen. So let's go to H2HS, which actually means add to home screen. So you add an icon to the home screen, just like an ADF app, to start your website or web application. And there's, some few, there's a, a few criteria that you need to adhere to. The web app is not already installed. Doesn't make sense to install it twice, right? It needs to be available over HTTPS. Well, that's what we already said. For other things, you should run it on HTTPS already. You should have a manifest file. Well, we just created one. And in the manifest file, you need to have a short name or a name, at least, a start URL, and the display must be full screen, standalone, or minimal UI. If the display is browser here, it doesn't make sense because you're just running the website in the browser, so it doesn't install. You need to have at least those two icons. Well, we have them. And you need a register service worker with a fetch event handler. Don't worry. If you don't have any idea what that is, I'll come back to that and ex uh, explain uh, how, how that works. Let's see how you now can add manually uh, a PWA to your home screen. So this is Chrome on an Android device. You go to the, say, kebab menu on the right and click Add to Home Screen. You get this dialog, and you just say Add. And you can see it's now there on my home screen. The image has now rounded corners. That's just done with by Android itself. It's not that I included that image, for instance. And if you start it, you get this splash screen for free. You don't have to do anything for it. You can see the background color and also the top bar color. And there is your application started as well. And it doesn't look like a website that's running in the browser, right? You don't see anything from the browser anymore. And if you want to switch to another app on your phone, you can see the icon is now on the top there as well. It's not a browser icon anymore. It's your PWA icon. If you go to a website, a PWA website on Firefox and Android, it already informs you how to add it to a home screen. It does it by itself, like this. And if you do that, you hit that home button, and you get the option uh, to add it to your home screen, just as easy as that. It's, it's a little bit easier. But that's all manual. And maybe you don't want to tell the user how to do it. It's like, go there, click this, and do that, and then it's on your home screen. Uh, you want to have it in a user-friendly way. And we can do that with the before install prompt. Uh, keep note, unfortunately, this only works on Chrome, Edge, Opera, and Samsung Internet. Not yet, not in Firefox and Safari. So Chrome will show this suggestion pretty soon at the bottom. Um, you do have to interact a little bit with the website, but after a while, you get this. But in my opinion, it's probably too soon. And also, it's like, what is this? It's it's in my face. What, what, what do I need to do here? Uh, I just met you, and this is crazy. What? So this might scare people off. Like, what is this? So wouldn't it be more nice to have, for instance, an, a menu option or a button on your website or a little explanatory text that say, well, if you want to, 
you can add it to your home screen and just let us figure it out and not the browser itself. So for this reason, I added a button in my HTML to say that says at, at the home screen. I made it a little bit nice and we hide the button at first. Okay, and then we create a JavaScript file called h2hs. It's just a name, you can name it any way you like. Uh, and what are we doing here? We're listening to the before install prompt from the browser. And, it, and when it's fired, we prevent it from showing the event. And then we do that with event.prevent default. Then we hook it up to our own variable called deferred prompt to use it later on. And in this way, now we can show the button on our website ourselves. Next, we're going to listen to a click on that button. And we first want to check if we still have that deferred prompt. So if the, the dialog was supposed to be uh, shown. And if we do, we can sh now show that native dialog and have the user choose whether to edit or not. It can be dismissed or accepted. And if it's, uh, if it's di dismissed or accepted, you could maybe uh, write that to your analytics, for instance. I just do a console log here now to see what happens, but maybe you can write it to your analytics and figure out why people do not install your PDOA, for instance. But if they do, we remove the button again, and we now have a home screen uh, installation. So let's see how that works. You can see the before install prompt is fired, and we now show a button. We click that, click that button, and we got the question if we want to install it. Yes, please. And now I run this on my Mac. If I go to my programs, to my launchpad, you can see it's there. And I can start it. And now I have my own PWA website running inside of a window in, in Mac. Isn't that awesome? OK, next topic is service workers. These are really the kings of PWAs and play in a very, very important role in it. So servers workers are a JavaScript file. They run in the background in a separate thread, so they are non-blocking. They are still scoped to your website, but they don't interfere or modify your page because they don't have access to the DOM, the document object model. They run asynchronously, so you need to use promises or async await. And they are event driven. You could think of it as like a man in the middle. And usually a man in the middle isn't that good because a man in the middle uh, is an attacker that will intercept all communication uh, between you and another party uh, and maybe do wrong stuff with that. If you're on an encrypted website or maybe an unprotected public Wi-Fi access point. So usually a man in the middle is not that great, but service workers actually are benign men in the middles, good men in the middles. And I like to call them Marvel in the middle actually, because they do intercept your connection to the server, but they do it in a good way and you can do wonders with it. So, Let's create a sw.js file, a service worker JavaScript file, and we are going to listen to two uh, events, install and activate. Install is like, well, we have a new service worker for you, and activate is like, OK, it runs now. Um, we need to hook up to that service worker file. So in our newly created app.js file, which we're going to include in the index.html, uh, we're going to first check if service worker is available. Remember IE, 
we want to make sure it's a modern browser, so we only uh, use it then. So we will register the service worker with a reference to the JavaScript file. And I just console log it when it's when it worked. So in my HTML, as, as mentioned, you need to include JS uh, slash app JS to use it. OK. And this is what happened. It says there's no matching service worker. OK, true. But if we reload it now, see, there's no service worker. We did reload it. And now you see, hey, we have a service worker there. But it's just set an on, another uh, message there saying, page does not work offline. Well, that's OK. We can work on that later. Well, actually, let's work on it right now. Because we have the cache API. If you want to be able to work offline, you need to use this API. You need to save files locally so you can use them later on. Uh, for instance, if there is no internet connection available or a bad one. So the service worker is installed, but actually doesn't do anything. Like if we reload this page, you can see that the files are all coming from the server. You can see that in the size column. And we want to catch, cache those files and just serve it from the user computer because that's way faster. So the first thing that we can do is cache static files. And that's what I'm doing here in the install event. I open a cache called static, and I put a bunch of files in there. We can do it a little bit prettier and more manageable. It's like, OK, we define two constants, one with the name of the cache and one with all the files, an array with all the files we want to uh, add to that cache. So we open that static cache and add them all at once. So if we do that and reload the page, you see there's a new service worker available. And now I have a static cache with all the files that we mentioned in the array. But we're not using it yet. And while developing, you can activate new service workers yourself. Users will have to close the tab of the browser or maybe the whole browser completely. Um, but for us, we can now use skip waiting. Um, there is another way, but I'll get back to that later on. OK, we now have some static caching. But now we want to use that cache for our application. So we can use the fetch API. Again. You can see the service worker is installed, but if we run it, it doesn't fetch anything from the cache. It's still the network. So let's change that. In our service worker, we can add an event listener, uh, event listener for fetch, fetching data from the internet. And what we do here is that we look at all the caches that we have, and we try to match the URL. That's the key in here. And if we find it, then we will return it from the cache. Otherwise, we still fetch it from the server. And let's have a look here. I have a new service worker. I use skip waiting to activate it again. Go to the network, clear it out, and refresh. And now you can see that in the size column, it says service worker. So everything is loaded from the cache, not from the network anymore. And what does that mean? Speed, definitely. You can see here that without caching, it took 145 milliseconds to load this. And it's running on localhost, my own 
uh, MacBook. So that's already fast. But if you look at the, using a service worker, it's even faster. It decreases to 59 milliseconds. So imagine what that can do for your website if, you, if your user is on a flaky Wi-Fi connection, for instance, or when you load maybe too much assets on your page. It really, really makes a difference. But if you cache stuff, we need to clean it up as well. The thing is, we should give our caches a, a version number um, because the service, will, service worker will look at all available caches and you might not get the right file back. You might get an old one back if you have multiple caches. So that can be very annoying. Um, for that reason, let's clean up caches where we don't want to use anymore and make sure the user always have the latest version. So to demonstrate this, I created another page called About, and I just put a link in the index HTML in it. And the About page is just like, okay, this is a demo site with a link to my real website, nothing special. And just a little styling to make it more pretty. If you only change one bit in the service worker JavaScript file, the service worker is changed. It will notice that it's, it's changed. So always set a new version number for your own sanity. In this case, I didn't add the about HTML in the static files variable, um, but we need a new service worker because we updated index.html. So keep that in mind. If you change one of these static files, you need to make sure that you uh, update the version number, otherwise it will never be loaded for existing users. So let's see what happens if we run this. You can see we now have a static V1 and V2. And if we reload the page, uh, we don't have an idea of uh, which index HTML is, is loaded now. It could be the old one or the new one. So let's do uh, some cleanup here. We go through all the caches when it's activated, we go to all the caches and through all the keys. And if we find a cache that doesn't have the latest version, so they say that the name of the static cache, in our case, static v2, we just delete it. And in that way, we only have the latest one available, only the one that we have defined. It's, it's not, it would be nice to have a website with just a few files, uh, but of course a website can have many files and you don't want to put them all in the static cache because that would be really impossible to keep track of all those files and updating your service worker each time one of those file changes. So let's introduce and look at dynamic caching. Um, you might have noticed I forgot to include the add to home screen JavaScript file. So before, just so just to make sure it's there also, I added it to the static files and bumped the version number of the static cache. And I also introduced a new constant, a new variable here called dynamic cache, dynamic v1. Okay. A few minutes ago, we had this code, this to get data from a cache. And when the file is not in the cache, we get it from the server, from the internet. Well, we can change it a little bit and say, well, we fetch it from the internet, but after we fetch it, we open a new cache, a new dynamic cache, and save it there as well, so we can use it the next time. Um, one thing you need to be aware of is that you need to clone the response of the fetch uh, API here because you can only use it once. So if you would use it to put it in the uh, in the cache, you cannot serve it to the website anymore. So that's why we have to clone it here. And we already had this piece of code to clean up our caches, our static cache. Well, just let add, just add something to clean that dynamic cache as well. Uh, 
Okay. And let's run this. We refresh, and now we have a static V2 and a static V3. I run skip waiting to delete static V2, and I go to the about page. OK, now you can see that in the static, I also have my H2HS JavaScript file now. And I have a dynamic uh, cache with the contents of the about HTML file. So that's great. So next time I can serve it from uh, the cache, and it will be super fast as well. But what if we were online? Or maybe if we are temporarily online because the Wi-Fi drops or the network has a hiccup, for instance. We can uh, solve that as well. OK. Let's look at this. And if I go offline and go to the About page, you can see it says again in Dutch, the site is not available. Um, so the dinosaur again, unfortunately. That's not a really good experience, right? We want to make sure that people see something different than, well, uh, sorry, it's broken. So for that reason, we can use, can use and create an offline page. So again, a very, very simple HTML file with just a message saying, well, sorry, your pa this page hasn't been cached yet. Why don't you try? any of our other pages. And maybe you could add something like, we think you're having network problems or you might be offline, something like that. It's, it's up to you. So what we need to do then is put that offline.html in our static files again, because we want to have it available always and bump the version number again, of course. So this is the code that we have, but we have to create a fallback if the fetch fails. So we add a catch here. And that catch makes sure that if it fails, the fetch fails, we now serve the offline HTML file from our static cache. Uh, but what if we are missing a JavaScript file or an image or a CSS file, for instance? Uh, we don't want to return the HTML for that, because God knows what happens then. So let's uh, include a little piece of code to check whether um, the request is really an HTML file or not. And only if it's an HTML file will uh, return this offline HTML file. And otherwise, we just completely ignore it. And again, let's demonstrate. Re reload, we skip waiting again. And go to static v4. You can see the offline HTML is there now. And the about page is not in our um, cache yet. And we go offline. If we go to the about page now, now you get the offline page. Well, that's much better than just showing having the browser showing saying, well, there, there's an error. There's no internet, right? OK, let's uh, talk about application shell. It's like, make it look like a native app. You've probably seen this um, from Facebook, for instance. If you're not online or you have a slow connection, they start with this. It, it looks like something's going on, but it's actually just perceived a perceived speed, a feeling of uh, speed. We can do the same in our PWA. So in this HTML file, I place some um, this with placeholder classes. And I created some CSS for it, including an animation to make it look a little bit pretty. And here's your animation. The background changes a little bit of color. OK. Because I altered the index HTML and the CSS, don't, 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 don't forget to bump the version number of your static cache. And if we run this, we 
skip the waiting. And we reload it. Now you can see something is happening. There might be something there pretty soon. And this is that perceived, perceived feeling of speed. So let's fill those uh, placeholders with some data. And let's fill them with dynamic data from a third party API endpoint. For instance, I want to use the superhero API, of course. So I fetch the data from that URL. And when I retrieved it, I will update the UI to this function. And this function isn't really pretty. It can definitely be improved on, but it serves its purpose now. It will place the data from the JSON, so the name, the height, the weight, the details, and the image that we get from the API into the HTML, uh, in the inner HTML of the placeholders we created. And it also makes sure that the background color of those uh, placeholders and the animation are gone. We include this new JavaScript file in our HTML, but, how, uh, but we don't want to run it immediately. Just make sure that everything else is loaded first and we make it run at the end. So that's why I'm using the defer attribute here. I add this, I add this new JavaScript file to my static files and I bump the version again. And let's run this. You see there's a V6, V6 now. And I run skip waiting. And if I refresh, there you go. It filled in the data from the, uh, the API. But you also see that, well, we now have the image here in our dynamic cache and the JSON reply. It's not the best practice to store dynamic data from an API like this JSON response in the cache. We have a better solution for that. And that's called IndexedDB. It's way more effective to catch, cache the uh, JSON files, for instance. It can be a bit tricky, but let's dive a little bit in it. So IndexedDB is an asynchronous transactional key value database in the browser for data that changes frequently and typically in JSON format. Well, that's exactly what we want, right? And because it's transactional, it means that if one thing goes wrong, it doesn't screw up the whole database. So that's also really helpful. Index DB itself is not that nice to use out of the box. So thank God for Jake Arch Archibald from Google to create a tiny wrapper called IDB. Um, it mirrors the most of Index DB API, but with some small improvements and promises to make a big difference to the usability for it. Uh, the latest IDB package is, by the way, assuming that you're using Webpack or Rollup, for instance. So I use an older version here so that I can include this JavaScript file and keep the demo simple. And we also created empty utils file. A different way to import scripts in the service worker is to use import scripts. So I want to use this in my service worker and I have available there. So I'm importing it here and also, again, in my static files in my static files and update the static cache version number. OK, now I now create here three constants in my utils file. Um, a name for my dynamic DB, a version, and a store name. Keep in mind that the version needs to be a number. I spent two hours of my life figuring out why it didn't work when I used V1. And we set the name and store heroes. That's like a, a, a table in a relational database, for instance. So we will open or create a database. And if necessary, we also create the, the store um, for it. And we set the, say, the index, the key path on the ID uh, from the reply in the JSON file. Then we have a, create, uh, a function called write data. Is when we retrieve data from the API endpoint, we want to write it to index DB. So we do it like this. 
I also created a clear all data function. Uh, you probably don't want to use this in production because you don't want to clear all the data out of the database. But for demo purposes, it's really useful now. And of course, we want to read data as well. So we have a read all data here. Um, it will use everything that's in the store. For demo, it's uh, very usable for in real life production. You want to probably extract certain things out of that uh, index DB and not everything. So we need to change the service worker a little bit um, because now only uses our static and dynamic uh, DB. What we do want to do is we want to save data to index DB. And in, for this case, we will first clear the database and then write all data in it. And of course, we want to return it to the screen as well. So the return rests here. Um, with the if statement, we will differentiate between the API endpoint, because that, that's what we define in API, uh, API URL, and any other uh, calls that we do. So in API.js, I changed it a little bit. I don't need the URL anymore. Uh, but I introduced network data received um, to keep track if it's already retrieved from the network or not. And I also have a function there called read all data. And if we don't have data from the network yet, so if we don't have re uh, didn't retrieve it from the network yet from the internet, then we will retrieve it from the cache. Most times, the cache will be faster than the internet, but you never know. So we create this if statement to make sure uh, that we don't ser um, serve all data uh, when it's already uh, updated by the network. So let's uh, see how that looks in this case. We use skip waiting. You can see the old cache is removed. And we refresh. And you can see, well, retrieve from cache is only fine because we didn't we hadn't saved it yet to our uh, database. So that makes sense. And if you go to the index DB now, you can see the table there is with the response of the API. So we did save it. So if we go back, cleared and refresh again, then you can see it's retrieved from the cache. UI is updated by the cache, but it's retrieved from the web again, because maybe it's newer. We updated the UI again, and we wrote the new data to the cache. Well, up to now, I I'm, I'm, did skip waiting every time. I mean, and I told you the user need to close the tab or the browser. And that's not nice, right? So we can prove that a little bit. We can create something called uh, a snack bar in this case, just a little notice to the user. So I created a diff here with some information. And make sure it's hidden first to show it later. And in a service work, we can listen to messages from our application. So I added some uh, logic here to listen to the event called message. And if that message contain an action called skip waiting, I now say skip waiting. That's what I do, did manually. In my app.js, I added uh, a little function to, uh, to show it, to show the update bar, and also listen to the click on that bar to send that message of skip waiting. Now it gets a little bit more tricky. If we have registered a service worker, we uh, have to listen to the update found uh, event. And when it's found, it will send a state change. And we only want to listen to the installed state. And if we have that installed state, then we can show the update bar. And if that user hits that button and that message is sent to a service worker, the service worker will also retrieve a controller change uh, event. And there we say, well, just reload the page so the user has the new one. So how does that work?
you can see there's a new service worker there waiting to be activated. But if I can hit it here on the button, and you see that the service worker in the right-hand side has gone, the new one. So it's activated and refreshed. You can also do this without showing a message to your user, uh, but you can Google that yourself and, and try to implement that. I wanted to show you a more elaborate example. Well, we're near the end. Have you ever heard of Workbox? Because everything I told you up to now, Workbox has an easier solution for it. Uh, sorry for that, but I wanted to show you the basics so you have a better understanding on how things work. Uh, but Workbox from Google is a great tool. It's a set of libraries and node modules uh, to make it easy to cache assets and take full advantage of the, of the features uh, used to build progressive web apps. So try it manually, try Workbox, at least try. And with that, I want to say thank you very much for attending. The slides are on top, rody.code slash devdays. And there's also a link there to my GitHub repository with all the slides here. So thank you very much. I don't see any questions. If you have some questions, just either write them in the Q&A or hook, hook me up on Twitter. Thank you very much.